I do enjoy this sort of topic. It's rather cool when you think about it. And I'm hoping the sound is louder. I am hoping. I'm hoping the sound is louder. I'm hoping I fixed it. So, survey ships in the Royal Navy. This is one of those topics which is interesting because it starts off with there are not really many ships which are survey ships. In that smaller ships tend to get used for surveying. But how they carry out the surveying doesn't make these ships specialist survey ships. Because they're just used for that role. I could spend a lot of time talking about interwar sloops. Because they're used for surveying. I could spend a lot of time talking about Age of Sail frigates. Because they're used for surveying. I could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of different ships because they're used for surveying. But that wouldn't be a history of survey ships because those ships are just being used for surveying. So I thought I'd focus in today on the ships which are actually for surveying, although in one case I have included a ship which is just, I just find interesting and cool story. I also find the fact that we don't have a decent picture of it an interesting and cool story. Um, it's always something to think about. But more importantly, this is going to be history of surveying. And I'm going to take a slightly different tack in this than I'm going to take in the live. In the live, I'm going to use it very much as a question answer session. So if you saw that on Sunday, because this will be coming out on the Monday, this will come out on the 30th of May. Hello, future. I'm speaking to you from the past, which is always cool, because I'm speaking about the past to you from the past to you. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be more, how do I put this, of a long patrol, long patrol on surveying. And hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hopefully you'll find it useful. Now, when this comes out, I'll be prepping to head to Canada. Literally, the countdown is on. I am back from the wedding. It was a very lovely affair. My best friend is now married. He's very happy. They are off to the Channel Islands, to viewers in the Channel Islands. If you meet a young couple who are from my neck of the woods, i.e. Surrey, Somerset, and they're on their honeymoon, say hi to them and make sure they get extra, extra fries. Because trust me, he will order them and she will make them. So make sure they get enough so that, you know, you can actually get a decent portion. <laughs> Leaving that to one side, on Thursday, I am picked up at roughly ungodly hour in the morning. I get to Gatwick at ungodly hour in the morning. <laughs> I get on plane at probably a slightly more sensible hour in the morning, but I have to get there at ungodly hour because if I don't, there is so much trouble going on at the airport at the moment, it might be interesting for me to get out there. And then I lift across the Atlantic, waving at all the battles as I fly past. And uh, yeah, I get to Toronto, Toronto. And then from Toronto uh, Airport, I go through, I pick up the hire car, and I drive to Hamilton, which will be interesting. First time I've driven in Canada in a long, long time. And uh, I'm probably going to drive the car straight to the hotel, because then it'll be sorted out there. And then from the hotel, I intend to walk, after I'm checked in, to see Haida. 
So there is a half chance you might get a very short live, depending on how well this is holding up, from in front of Haida. I'm currently testing out a couple of different systems. I've got both Streamlabs paid for on here. So I've got the Prime version, which works a lot better than the normal version. And there's, of course, the YouTube's own system. Now, theoretically, the YouTube's own system is fine. But so far, every time I've tested it, it's been a bit weird. Which is why I ended up going, right, then I'll do the monthly Streamlabs pay along with the um, XSplit. Although Streamlabs actually costs more than XSplit. It's been one of those weirdness of life. Anyway, leaving that to one side, I visit and scout Haida on my uh, on Friday morning. Then I go pick up Drac and the rest of the team from Toronto Airport. Then we go to dinner, where we've been very very kindly invited to dinner by um, one of our friends in the area. Very kind. If you listen to Bill Trump's the re uh, one of the recent episodes, I Last week's episode, you will probably guess who it is invited us. And then Saturday, uh, Saturday we film on Haida. That's when we also, if any of you happen to be there, want to come say hello to us, you're more than welcome to. Then we have dinner with Canadian fans. It's been organised. There's a pub being picked. There's all sorts of details down in Discord. So it looks like a really nice place. They do really nice food. Very, uh, Stafford and Wayne have outstunned themselves. It's going to be great fun. And yeah, that's the beginning of the Canadian adventure of me and Drac. Drac is now with me for all of it. He arrives the day after me and he leaves on the same day now. His plane got put, he got put back. <laughs> Basically, they said, we're cancelling that flight. You're going to go on the later flight, which is mine. And I went, hello, <laughs> welcome to <laughs> traveling in my plane. To which he promptly announced, I'm going to upgrade. I I'm going to consider upgrading myself to first class. And I went. You do realize if you go down, I'm going to follow you because. And the only reason I'm staying in normal class is because you, uh, because I was persuaded it was more, it was sensible enough. It was fine enough. If you're going to first, I can use that as an excuse. Anyway. Hydrography and survey according to the Royal Navy. Now, this comes from the Royal Navy's own website, which the Royal Navy are quite obsessed with. And they rather like this. One of the usual discussions I get into with people is to go, so why is the hydrography and survey department not privatized? Well, there are three rather important reasons for why it's not privatized. One, the data is actually really quite important. And in the nicest way, it's very important, especially in certain areas where submarines might like to go in and out quietly. And we'd rather have accurate enough, but not so accurate, tables meet or reach out to the public and reach out to the wider world. So, yeah, security reasons. There's also the fact that actually they managed to make enough money, they pay for themselves, which is useful, having a apart from the Navy, which that basically fund itself. And um, there's also the fact that those ships, those systems, whilst in peacetime they go around surveying and doing these lovely maps and all this stuff, which we, hydrography and these, these charting waters, all, all beautiful stuff, in wartime they have an absolutely absurdly critical role, which is forgotten. Which is basically, if you're carrying out any amphibious operations or inshore waters, you're going to want a survey done instantaneously and immediately. Why? Because you want to know where rocks are, where anything that gets in front of a uh, way of landing craft is going to be. You want to know the beach types. You want to know draft and clearances. And you need to know all this data yesterday. I mean, the classic example is the Falklands War, where they pretty much have to reinvent the wheel. Because they knew the wheel existed, they knew what they were supposed to do, but so many capabilities had been salami sliced that they had to reinvent it. 
and frankly the survey ship crews ended up doing a lot more than they were supposed to to cover for reinventing that wheel so it's worthwhile you it's worthwhile and very critical to have the other day i was at a major conference and one of the figures which kept going around was 90% of you british trade by value 95% by volume goes by sea 90% by value 95% by volume for britain sea lines of communication are not something nice to have and i know it's easy to get that in this time when you see things looking very scary around the world and I know in a world which has convinced itself that it's there's kind of a bit of a bifocus in that you have people who will at the same moment say that there's no point in worrying about having a navy because any war would be nuclear war and destroy the world so there's not going to be no resupply and at the same point turn around and go well we need a large army to fight in Eastern Europe and you go well what? Because what's your large army going to do about that nuclear war? You're not going to do anything. The actual response, by the way, and I tend to get this is yes, Britain does need a decent sized army. They also need a decent sized navy. And oh, you're arguing for the wrong thing. You you are arguing based on the idea that funding in the first place is enough. If you're being forced to decide between your sword and your shield, then you are a knight in a lot of trouble. And that's before we start to consider your helmet, breastplate, and the rest of your armour. You have to pick between your sword and your shield. That's a false economy. That's a stupid thing to think do. When you're talking about protecting the body national. So, yeah. These things matter. Now... So listing this, the economy of the United Kingdom relies on the oceans. By conducting these other oceanographic surveys, the Royal Navy ships helps keep uh, the routes of global maritime trade open for business. The Royal Navy's hydrographic ships carry out detailed surveys of the ocean floor and use the data they collect to update worldwide navigation charts. These charts are used by commercial vessels and the Royal Navy ships alike in order to navigate the world's ocean safely and effectively effect efficiently. Hydrographic survey ships work in a variety of sea areas to govern, process hydrographic and oceanographic data such as sea depth, wave height, and barometric, uh, barometric pressure. The Royal Navy uses this information for planning and operational purposes. It's also uh, something of the other advantage of it being done by a government-owned, and gov entirely government organization such as the Royal Navy, is that um, the data they produce tends to be fairly darn reliable, in that, yes, there might be bits of it which are redacted or greyed out for submarine purposes, but let's put it this way. There's no chance someone can turn around and go, well, you're owned by that company and that company, so your data regarding this and this scenario, which might have effects for global environment, uh, should be um, sus. Because they're not. The data is also dispatched to the UK Hydrographic Office for analysis and inclusion into navigation charts and other navigation and navigational safety publications. And HMS Scott, the only ship of her class and largest service vessel in Western Europe, is deployed at sea for up to 300 days a year. This is what's fun. She carries the high resolution multi beam uh, sonar system, which is capable of surveying 150 square kilometers ocean floor every hour. Don't take this the wrong way. There are many ships if I was a submarine that would be on my entire list, but HMS Scott would be number one. That multi-beam sonar, yes, people will turn around and go, that's not an only submarine warfare sonar. No, but if you're trying to hide on the ocean floor to avoid people, that will pick you out in seconds. It's not an ASW sonar, but it can be used <laughs> as one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I want to personally get anywhere close to if I'm a submarine. So this is the history of surveying. Um, this basically explains why you have survey ships. It's not a, a sort of a relatively late appearance in terms of specialist shipping. Because 
pre-1940, your survey is pretty much done by dropping a lead line. So you're carrying some long, thin rope, and it's got a lead weight on the end. And usually you work out depth in fathoms. Gives you interesting chart points. If you ever notice those charts which have, especially the older ones, which have little numbers all around them. Those are plunge, uh, plunge line points. Um, and that's the depth of the plunge line. But that tells you as this shows, what the depth is at that individual spot. And then between the 40s and 80s, you have single beam. Now we have the multi-beam system. Now, single beam, you basically have to look like you're mowing the lawn, and it's very, very precise. Multi-beam... You can do ever so slightly more in one go. But we have really only a tiny fraction of the world's oceans fully analysed. And when I say fully analysed, no, I don't even mean fully analysed. Uh, we only have a tiny fraction of the world's oceans that we actually have the full data on all the mountain ranges. We are still understanding. There was actually a debate a couple of years ago about tectonic plates and whether or not we have missed whole plates because of our misunderstanding of what it's like underneath the oceans, and whether this may or may not have an impact on earthquakes. Thankfully, it turns out we probably haven't missed out a whole tectonic plate, but it was an interesting debate for a good few years. It was kind of cute, and it's always nice to have these debates. But this is the differential you're talking about, and... This is the period where specialist ships start to come into existence. And these are the ships we're dealing with now. This is what the world was like before. This is why you don't have specialist ships. Because you can't justify a specialist ship for that. There's also examples of this surveying being used, though, for amphibious operations. If we consider, just example, Quebec. How do they know they could take, use ships to take the troops upriver, land wolf, where they did? They'd surveyed the waters. They'd gone up and down them with boats, dropping lead lines. Just think of the hours they had to do that to get an idea whether they could do it. It's a long and very painstaking process. I'd also argue that it's a very advantageous process for navies to be involved in. Because it's a nice way to link military sonar, naval sonar, with civilian sonar developments and to keep pace on what the latest developments in both fields is. I think this is one of the reasons why we often forget the capabilities of anti-submarine warfare sonars and the systems at our peril. Everyone focuses in on the submarines and goes, they're getting better and better. But that's because in so many ways we are surrounded permanently by sonar in our civilian life that we miss its own improvements. There's also another factor that the navies tend to be even quieter about whole sonar systems than they do about the submarines which might carry them and certainly about the ships which carry them. It's not a panacea though. This is not, I'm not telling you it's the 1920s and Asdix here and we no longer need to worry about the submarine threat. Which I often wonder if it's whether wishful thinking under the Royal Navy as much as the false positive exercises, but that does ultimately show you the problem with the false positive of exercises. Here is a chronology, roughly, of uh, uh, compiled by Geoffrey P. Mason, who's a lieutenant commander at Royal Navy Retired in 2007, for the Naval History.net and their hydrographic survey. 
and it's as good a, a good a chronology as, frankly, one can find. 1801, Height of the Napoleonic Wars, first Admiralty chart published. 1807, Naval Chart Committee came into being. 1819, Admiralty takes over Royal Observatory Greenwich, and also permission given to sell Admiralty charts to the Merchant Marine. Remember, prior to that point, Admiralty charts have been in such demand throughout the 1700s and etc. that they were to be heavily protected. And the fact is, the French were offering double the money for any ship which was found with an Admiralty chart. You take that Admiralty chart, you double your money. That's how good they were. 1823, first sailing directions published by a hydro hydrographer. 1829, first light list published by a hydrographer. 1832, promulgation of information to keep charts up to date began in a nautical magazine. 1833, first tide tables produced by a hydrographer. 1834, first notices to mariners issued by a hydrographer. 1842, Admiralty Compass Department, and uh, yet set by Rear Admiral Sir Francis Beaufort. He was hydrographer for 26 years. He gave his name to the scale used for a wind, a wind and weather. Yes, that's where the Beaufort scale comes from. 1902, 60 years later, International Council for the Exploration of the Sea established in Copenhagen. 1919, World's First International Hydrographic Conference. Taking place after World War One, notably to deal with some of the issues arising from World War One and the traffic issues it's created for the sea. Mines floating everywhere, oh my lord. <sighs> 1921, uh, International Hydrographic Bureau established in Monaco. They do pick such terrible places, these hydrographers, for me. I have to be honest. Copenhagen, you know, Monaco. 1922, first Admiralty list of wireless stations published. 1967, International Hydrographic Bureau is renamed the International Hydrographic Organization. 1968, automatic, automatic data processing equipment, computers, first introduced into Her Majesty's survey ships. 1971 to 1980, International Decade of Ocean Exploration. And 1978, Iron Hydrographic Department received the Queen's Award for Export Achievement. My my, they have been doing a lot, and they are good, they are useful, and they all their history back to Merlin. Now Merlin is the first ever ship which is listed as being a servo ship. Now she is technically an eight gun yacht. She's 109 tons burden, which is fun. And, well, she's employed between 1861 and 1693 by Captain Grenville Collins to complete a comprehensive survey of the British coastline, which is published in 19, uh, 1693 as Great Britain's Coasting Pilot. It was the first warship, therefore, dedicated to survey work rather than an exploration, or just doing its job. It does replicate some errors from the Dutch maps, I have to admit in it, but we'll leave that to one side. However, in her earlier life, she caused this in 1671. Lord Arlington had ordered Merlin, carrying the English ambassador's wife, one Dorothy Osborne, to pass Dutch ships anchored near Brill. Under treaty, the Dutch struck their flag in salute, but they failed to fire the white smoke courtesy, which is a courtesy normally given to warships. The Dutch commander, Van Ghent, Explained he was doubtful as to whether Merlin, with its eight guns, and being a yacht carrying a ambassador's wife, came into that category and didn't want to create precedent because, as you all know, if you watch my channel, 
maritime law is tremendously more precedent than it is actual written down rules and regulations. Rules and regulations get in the way of precedent. There is this old saying, 90% of maritime law is yet to be written, and 90% of what is written is precedent. It's in other words, you can technically choose to ignore it, because there's no actual technical reason why you have to follow it, other than it's the historically established norm, and it's upheld as such. You uphold it as uh, upheld as such. Oh, I had some. <laughs> anyway, um, that, of course, started a little war, known as the Third Anglo-Dutch War. Um, yeah. Hello. Uh, this particular interesting battle took part in, and was known as, of course, a glorious and completely utter... How do I put this? Terrible war. Terrible war for the British. There's the raid on the... Yeah. There's all sorts of things which happens in this war, and it's just not good. Uh, what can I say? This is the uh, from the, the sort of picture of the sixteen sixty seven raid on the Medway. The year after Merlin had been launched, and one of the reasons given for the pursuit of the war. Then we have HMS Hecate. Now Hecate is another interesting vessel because technically she's a four gun Hydra class paddle sloop. Launched from Chatham Dockyard in 1839. She takes part in this as part of the Mediterranean Station in the Syrian War and various other things. However, she is refitted eventually for fitted out to run for survey operations uh, as assigned to Pacific Squadron. And undertakes the surveys along the British Columbia coast. And in fact, this finds the Hecate Strait between British Columbia mainland and the islands of Haida Gui. And also serves on the Australia station, um, surveying Botany Bay, Monathan Bay, uh, the Brisbane River, and Torres Strait. She would eventually be paid off and um, decommissioned and broken up in 1865. But yes, this is the second mm, sort of survey ship. In that, technically, she's not built as a survey ship, but she spends most of her life doing survey work, and therefore is pretty much the precedent for what we have going on after this. Doesn't matter what the ship is, pretty much after this point, they tend to be smaller warships, which are adapted to the survey role. Usually by carrying a lot of extra rope and spaces for people who are going to want to carry ink and parchment and do drawings. Weird, weird people. Who wants to spend their time drawing when they can spend their time blowing things up with cannon? But apparently there are naval officers who do, and the Royal Navy has always tried to be an inclusive employer and include all its members in their pursuit and their pretty drawings come in handy every now and again when you want to navigate places, so, you know, it's it could be mutually beneficial, I suppose. Could be. I should probably put a, a cynicism warning on this one, or at least a sarcasm warning. Anyway, then there's HMS Challenger. Now, Challenger is another interesting vessel. <laughs> uh, honestly, I was looking at the various vessels and going, which one am I going to pick out from this period? I'm, like, I'm going to pick Challenger. Because she is weird. She's technically built as a survey ship. She's laid down in 1930 and built in a dry dock at Chatham Dockyard. 
then she's commissioned in 1932 at Portsmouth. She basically spent her time surveying the waters around the United Kingdom, Labrador, West Indies, and East Indies. In 1932, she had managed to um, strike a rock six nautical miles off Ford's Harbour, Labrador, and was pre uh, be uh, was uh, beached and then later refloated. Uh, she would serve in home waters and as a convoy escort. Um, in fact, in June and July 1921, she and three flag class corvettes escorted Anselm, a troop ship, from Britain to for, to three towns, Sierra Leone. During this, Anselm was, of course, torpedoed north of the Azores, and Challenger and um, the corvette Starwalk managed to rescue survivors and transferred them to the armed merchant cruiser HMS Cathay. Between 42 and 46, she surveyed the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. And in 1946, uh, she returned to Chatham for a refit before heading back to the Persian Gulf. Um, she left the Gulf in 47, then went to Cyprus, where a shore party logged the tides, then proceeded to Gibraltar for another refit in dry dock. She took part in the operations off Aden in December 1947, and she circumnavigated the world uh, from 1950 to 53, surveying the West Indies and the Far East. And it was on this mission then in 1951 that the Challenger surveyed the Mar Mariana Trench near Guam and found some of the deepest points in the ocean. 11,033 meters deep at this maximum, it was found. This point has been named forever Challenger Deep. But it was first surveyed in 1875 by a previous HMS Challenger at this point. So basically, Challenger went back to confirm that Challenger Deep existed and to remind everyone that it was found by a Challenger, which was HMS Challenger. Ah. I could, of course, include HMS, the other HMS Challenger, the 1858 one. Uh, which was, of course, a converted Pearl class Corvette in the list of survey ships from a Challenger expedition. But I've done a video on the Challenger expedition, and I didn't want to go over those grounds, so I've got Challenger, the other one. It's kind of strange that we don't have a currently have a Challenger in service. It would be quite a nice thing to have in service because it's quite nice for the oceanographic. A hydrographic quadrant, etc., to be able to go look. Here's our history in the example next week. Then there is HMS Protector. Now, name of course, which is currently in service, one of the older ships of this name. She, well, she's laid down originally as a net layer, but. She's eventually modified and becomes one of the Royal Navy's first Antarctic patrol vessel. And that is really is the best picture I can find of her. She's built by Yarrow Shipbuilders, that's Glasgow. She's laid down in 1935, launched in 1936, commissioned in 19, uh, commissioned in December 1936. Um, she became an Antarctic patrol ship in 1955. And she serves till roughly 1970. During that time, she carries helicopters and does all sorts of things. But she is a very critical asset to the Royal Navy for many, many years. She'd been a, a, a fleet reserve training ship prior to conversion to this role. And as part of her conversion, she gained a rudimentary hangar and flight deck for her two helicopters both Western Worlands, fun helicopter to have, and she made her first Antarctic patrol the winner of 55-56, uh, and she served down there, I said, for 13 more, uh, 13 more times in her career. Her patrols, she would rescue passengers, including um, MV, uh, rescue several ships, including MV Ferron, which included Sir Edmund Hillary and Dr. Vivian Fouche. And in 1957, Protector rescued the passages of the 
RRS Shackleton, the Royal Research Ship Shackleton, which had struck an iceberg and had to perform emergency repairs due to the sinking. But she is eventually scrapped and replaced with HMS Endurance. HMS Vidal, a cute ship, if ever there was one. And quite a successful little ship. Continuing the tradition of Chatham Dockyard building these sort of surface ships, and she, this is a Vidal is actually the last surface vessel built in Chatham Dockyard. She was the first small ship designed to carry a helicopter, laid down in July 1915, launched in July 1931, and completed in March 1934 at a cost of 1.345 million. In common with, well, basically. Most ships of the time are named for a reason in terms of survey work, and they're usually named for explorers, but you know you have various things going on. Destroyers tend to get aggressive names. Destroyers is fun because they're in class. And they're getting those particular names. So the Royal Navy has naming theme going on, and yeah, that you could say we've returned to that theme in a way at the moment with Scott and with... <coughs> David Attenborough. But um, yeah, she is named for Alexander Thomas Emmerich Vidal, who had surveyed the coast of Africa and range of the Atlantic to survey the tiny inlet of um, Rock All. So far, surprisingly enough, she's been the only Royal Navy ship to bear this name. Can't think why. It was, um, well, let's put it this way, rather pertinent that she was named as she is, because uh, the development of the Cold War is what led the British government to decide to form the Annex Rockall. This was authorised in September 1934 by, with orders from Queen Elizabeth, currently celebrating a jubilee, Transmitted to Vidal the telling, on arrival at Rockall, you will effect the landing and hoist the Union flag on whatever spot appears most suitable or practical, and you will take possession, uh, possession of the island on our behalf. And so, on the 18th of September, 18th September 8, 1935, at precisely 10.16 a.m., Lieutenant Commander Desmond Scott, Royal Navy, Sergeant Brian Peel, Royal Marines, Corporal A.A. Fraser, Royal Marines, James Fisher, a civilian naturalist and former Royal Marine who was aboard, were detailed deposited on the island by Royal Navy helicopter and cemented a brass plaque on Hall's Ledge and hoisted the Union flag to stake the UK's claim. And this inscription reads, By authority of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and our other realms and territories, Queen Head of Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, in accordance with Her Majesty's instructions dated the 14th day, 14th day of September 1955, a landing was effected this day upon this island of Rock Hall from HMS Vidal. The Union flag was hoisted, and possession of the island was taken into the name of Her Majesty. Signed, R.H. Con uh, Connell, Captain, HMS Vidal, 18th September 1955. Now, the plaque was still in place till 1997. However, it disappeared after some Greenpeace protesters visited um, in some time in, uh, uh, in some time in 1997, apparently. Uh, Vidal would have a slightly less exper uh, enjoyable rest of her career, although she still had some highlights, including taking Sir Edmund Irving, Admiral, Chief Hydrographer of the Royal Navy, to Leningrad for talks with Animal, uh, Admiral Anatoly Rosenko um, in the Soviet Union. Uh, they went to Leningrad for, talk, uh, for talks. And in 1967, she transported scientists and personnel to Azarov Atoll and Diego Garcia for the Royal Society, basically. Rock Hall is one of those interesting little
it's uh well technically in the middle of nowhere but the trouble is because it's in the middle of nowhere and if we consider what's happened in terms of historical terms with uh, recent incidents in the south china sea and east china sea etc Piece of rock in the middle of nowhere which are unclaimed can get claimed and used for nefarious purposes, i.e. purposes not within your interests. And whilst I realise this might upset some of my viewers who um, are of that group from Greenpeace's inclination, for British purposes, especially during the Cold War, a rock hall, which sits not that far from the United Kingdom it might be a piece of rock in the middle of the Atlantic. But if it's claimed by someone else and they work with that piece of rock and are prepared to put in the massive, humongous amount of money necessary, they could turn that piece of rock into a very, very big problem. It might not be something you want to think about. It might not be something, especially in the halcyon days in 1997 when there was a cold war in it and everyone thought peace was coming and there was going to be no more war, wars only of choice and no peer-on-peer -peer conflict between major powers. But for those of us who didn't drink that Kool-Aid, or as I would say, that particular can of soda. It was never a good idea to have it left on its own. Now, at the moment, of course, Ireland and the United Kingdom both claim ownership of it. And Rockall is closer to the UK coast than the Irish coast. Um, mainly, I think, Ireland tends to put their efforts into it because they don't want to be discounted. And there is always a worry that it could have very interesting resources. But technically, e in easy terms and everything else terms, Rockall is part of the United Kingdom. And In, for example, in 2017, when we did check into those details and the doc documents were declassified, uh, it were a decision to claim the rock as UK territory was apparently motivated by worries that it could be otherwise be used by hostile interests, agents to spy on the future South Oost missile testing range. But it's a fun thing to have, and it's a useful space to have. All right, HMS Enterprise, A71. For many years, one of the smallest ships in the Royal Navy. It was an Echo class survey ship, 122 tons, standard displacement, 163 tons, fully loaded. A crew a speed of 14 knots and a crew of 18. Basically, this is uh, in well, it's an inshore survey vessel. Um, She's looking at seas, but sandbanks, coastlines of the East Coast and East, Ang East English Channel. Um, she'd spend most of her time probing up harbours of Eastern England and showing flag in sort of Belgian, Dutch and German ports off coast. 
I'm going as hard as Ryan in a, a Ryan. A, a, no, Ryan as hard as Carl as Colin. Sorry. I should go on the Ryan. I'm always looking and distracted by my notes here because this was the Enterprise, which was around when Star Trek first became popular, and she ends up becoming known in the Royal Navy as the Starship. And I'm sorry for TV. That star is one of the things I've always been amazed is if you look at the USS Enterprise, there is various ships, usually good model, Aegis sail ships, and this, that, and the other, all these things. Yeah. They don't have a model of this one. I think there's something missing from Star Trek. If I, next time I see the Enterprise's wall of ships named Enterprise, there is not. Little 1959 HMS Enterprise, I am going to write a letter of complaint. <laughs> oh, I, I did completely consider this the aircraft carrier as all that. And in this thing, he's on there as well. <laughs> oh, I, I've got to stop laughing. I've got to stop laughing. Okay. <sighs> I will stop laughing. Okay. HMS Endurance. Uh, right. She is acquired by the Royal Navy in 1967. She's technically launched as the Anita Dan of the Danish in 1956. So she's already 11 years old when the Royal Navy gets her into service. But basically, she's the for, uh, she's the ship around in the Falklands War. She is the critical vessel used for the Royal Navy for many many years as their Arctic vessel, Arctic ship, and would serve the Royal Navy in 1967 until 1991. So, by my count, and I realise my maths is not always that great, 24 years. Nicknamed the Red Plum, or HMS Encumbrance, certainly has some interesting looks to her. Well, it's of course her withdrawal without, uh, from the Arctic Pro uh, Patrol without apparent replacement. Um, is supposed to have encouraged the Argentine invasion. Um, I think myself, whilst the Franks report might be right in its phraseology, I think it was more a case of this is an extra confirmation of something we've already decided on. Uh, when you're looking, it's basically, it's one of those things that when you're looking for confirmation, you see and you go, ah, that confirms it. Not quite sure it's such a clear signal. But there again... The trouble is, this was really the last permanent placement, uh, permanent presence down in that particular waters. So that's the point, I think. It's more the fact that this withdraws regular presence, and it shows the importance of the presence mission. It's one of those things you can't place a value of presence apart from its absence, and the loss of endurance, uh, the announced withdrawal of endurance, was immediately creates a vacuum of presence. So while it's there, does it really do much? No, but it shows you're there. And it's kind of like the OPVs currently deployed to the Far East. Do they really do much? No, but they're there. And when we have a Type 31 or something also deployed there, which would be sensible, a Type 31 or 32, or perhaps one of each, both sitting in the Far East, operating Singapore, and two OPVs sitting out there, you've got four ships, and suddenly you've got two small ships doing presence and helping out with... Maritime security issues in the area. Great, thank you very much. Counter piracy ops, counter smuggling ops, counter drug ops, all those diplomatic buildings and two sort of low end warships, but warships there permanently. And then you have a carrier group turning up occasionally. Suddenly that adds up to a lot of commitment and a lot of presence where you might need it to have influence. Because you start to think and actually act like you have global influence. Interesting to see where other ships get based. I, myself, I would like to see more work done in the Falklands to make it more of a forward base. 
because I would like more of a... I think it's a good thing for Britain to have more of a presence forward in the Antarctic, to have more of the uh, more of a forward presence in the South Atlantic and the environs of there, and the Southern Pacific as well. And you can do that from the Falklands, you can sustain that from the Falklands if you build it up. And that, of course, has the advantage of being British territory. It's kind of like the Pictan Islands. If we could do a bit of work there, that'd be really quite helpful. Right, HMS Beagle. I like ships which are named for dogs. I do. Speaking of dogs, appropriately for Beagle arriving on the screen, we are joined by the training assistant, the research assistant, to talk about HMS Beagle, aren't we? Yes, we are. So, Beagle was a bulldog class. Now, of course, this one is not a bulldog, or a fox, or a fawn, or a beagle. But you are cuter than all of them, aren't you? Yes, you are. Anyway, Beagle had quite an interesting career as well. All survey ships have a sort of a bit of an interesting career. It comes from being out on the zappy edge of the world. Now, during her service, Beagle managed to do the Indian Ocean, West Indies, Scotland, and South Africa. Pretty much did the equivalent of travelling around the world many, many times, both that way and that way. She really did get her experience in. And following her half-life refit, uh, half refit in 1990, uh, she was fitted with the first modern surveying information processing system, or SIPS. Now, SIPS is quite an important thing. Why? Because it allows them to process the humongous volumes of data. This is the other thing about survey ships. They process a lot of data and a lot of information. Again, quite a lot of the answers we've had that have come with sonar have not come from necessarily the sonar end of the systems, but, or even the hydrophonic end of the systems, but from the ability to process, to sift that data. And that's where hydrophonic survey ships really come in handy, because they provide us with a normal, um, enormous amount of data about what goes on in the oceans. Okay? That is useful. That amount of data allows you to sift more accurately when you're looking for things which shouldn't be going on in the ocean, because you have so much information about what noises are normal in the ocean and what things are going on in the ocean that you can better detect when things are going wrong. It's kind of like if you own a pet. And this particular creature, of course, looks lovely. Now, when he's silent and in my arms, I know everything's fine in the world. When he goes silent and I can't see him, then I know someone might well be up to no good, because even in his sleep he makes his noises. Yes. So if he's not sleeping, I can't see him, and he's silent, the odds are he's doing something he shouldn't be. There you go. Absence of noise. It helps us all. Now, she was extensively modified throughout her life. She got, or she starts off with a 28 foot survey launch, which is eventually replaced by a 31 foot survey launch. Rather interesting enough, that sort of progress is kind of like what's currently going on in the world of uncrewed or optionally crewed uh, light vessels. Uh, I got to see a whole lot of those at the recent um, defense show I went to, defense conference. And it's Really quite interesting, the advance in those and the size growth. I know we'll be talking about the St. Bilge pumps, probably to say on Monday when this goes live. We're going to be talking a lot about what we saw at this conference. And it's it's interesting. Right. And then we have Herald. You're a bit of a Herald, aren't you? You can tell everyone what they're going on. Herald, of course, was a Herkler class. Cool ship. Basically, a combined hydrographic and oceanographic survey vessel. Built to merchant standards and similar design to RRS Discovery. 2,000 ton standard, 2,945 tons fully loaded. Right? During the Falklands War, she serves as a Red Cross ship, um, ferrying casualties from San Carlos to Montevideo. During 1983, she served the South Atlantic Guard ship, and following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990, 
She was deployed to the Eastern Mediterranean as a support ship for the Minehunters of the 3rd Campaign Countermeasure Squadron. Again, the other use of hydrographic survey vessels. Mine hunting, mine warfare. They have almost endless uses, and they are incredibly useful to have. But they're also quite expensive for a ship which doesn't have weapons. Which is fine, because if you start putting a lot of weapons on them, people won't like them coming up to their shores when they're doing survey. As it is, they have a need, uh, they have a legitimate reason to be there. They're surveying. So it's kind of like you, if I put you in full battle rifle instead of with your fluffy fur. In your fluffy fur, you look lovely. Yes, you've got jaws. Yes, you are a mighty corgi warrior. Look at these fists of your fists of fury, paws of power. But um, if he were, he looks far less menacing than if he did. If I um put him in a sort of commando camouflaged body armor, or actually went full medieval war dog on him and gave him a full you know metal armor, you could carry that, wouldn't you? You'd look like you'd you'd enjoy being all night nice fluffy. She was paid off in 2001, decommissioned in 2001, and she's one of the ships which is replaced by Echo and Enterprise. Now, she was actually renamed Somerville, and after Admiral Sir James Somerville, yes, the gentleman from World War II, and was used for hydrographic survey in Irish waters. 2004, sold to India and broken up that year. That's sad. But she did well. I'm not sure where you're planning on going, but you're not going anywhere. You might try it, but you're not going anywhere. Hello. Oh. Now, again, the other interesting thing about survey ships is the amount of them which have names which, frankly, are a little bit, well, Fox, Deer, Fawn, Roebuck, these sort of names like to come up quite a bit for some reason, and Roebuck is a very special case. Roebuck, well, how do I put this? Technically, she's used for surveying along the UK continental shelf. However, she was also enhanced to operate overseas, and she often did. She was fitted with a full suite of hydrographic sensors and had a survey motorboat, a survey motorboat for inshore work. Um, she'd be dishing another ship decommissioned with the entry in the service of the Echo class, rather like the Heckler class. And it's one of those interesting things, again, as always, if we consider it, the ships lost when the Echo, Echo and Enterprise come into service. Well, we lose Herald. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lose Roebuck in 2010, we lose Bill, uh, Beagle and Bulldog, uh, 2001, 2002, and, uh, yeah. So, we roughly have four ships replaced by two. Yeah, we'll just be lucky we can't make my Scott. She's wrong, we should ship. Right, I'm going to quickly um, let this gentleman go and... And then we have HMS Endurance to one, which is more commonly remembered when I talk about Endurance, but is actually the one which served 1991 to 2008. And had her own list of interesting nicknames. Her motto, of course, was um, by Endurance We Conquer. And still nicknamed the Red Plum. So, she started her life as the MV Polar Circle in 1990. In 1991, is sort of hired as the HMS Polar Circle. And by 1992, is HMS Endurance. She was a Class 1 Icebreaker, which is a pretty useful ship to have. And was often used for um what was the say? Okay. Icebreakers are pretty darn tough ships. 
and I have seen many reasons given in the past for why Her Majesty or various other royal displays they would be put on a dignitary who put on the icebreakers to go round, search, you know, when there's a review of ships. Yes, they're doing it from the icebreaker. It's because it's the red ship, so it sticks out and all sorts of things. No, no, here's the reason. That is a freaking hard thing to sink, okay? That is a thing designed to, to wage war against Mother Nature. Mother Nature is possibly the most powerful admiral you will ever fight as a sailor. She has storms, she has ice, um, ice, she has every tool of fury in her arsenal you can imagine. If she's annoyed with you, she will humble you. As such, the mere weapons of human beings, well, they're rather less scary when you're, when you're in an HMS Endurance. And she does a lot of work now however as said mentioned she was out of service in 2008 this was because after an extensive deployment in December she suffered flooding to her machinery spaces low accommodation decks which resulted in the near loss of the ship yes she is designed as best they can to keep water and another nature out once they get in, it's a very dangerous procedure and a very dangerous period. They actually even showed it because they had a TV show, a TV series, a crew aboard um, the Ice Patrol TV series. They actually sh uh, did an episode showing what happened the day the ship almost sunk. She, of course, was replaced. But this is HMS Scott, and HMS Scott is a rather cute ship. She wasn't a replacement for Endurance, but HMS Scott has gone down to the far south many times and to the far north. She is a critical vessel for the Royal Navy. She's probably, and quite possibly, the most powerful and most capable sonar that's currently at sea. I know that's a big thing to state, but you cannot overstate the amount of effort and amount of funding put in to making sure that ship is basically a rather large floating sonar. Um, she's technically the Royal Navy's only ocean survey vessel, she can remain at sea for up to 300 days a year, thanks to a crew rotation system. Um, she has 78 crew officially attached, of which two thirds need to be present for her to operate. So if you consider 78, what does that work out? That works out as three sets of 26. So she needs an actual crew to operate of 52. Capable of 18 knots, she was, uh, she surveyed the seabed in 2005 around the uh, Indian Ocean earthquake site. Um, the survey revealed that the earthquake had completely rewritten the topography of the seabed. She was given the freedom of Swansea in 2006. Um, she's had a fair number of refits in her time to keep herself at the highest ready for this. Uh, she was, as shown in this picture, deployed to South Atlantic and Arct Antarctic to cover for HMS Endurance when we didn't have an icebreaker, and hosted artist uh, Rowan Huntley for a month in Antarctica and as the, in the new Artist in Residence program for the Royal Navy, inaugurated by Friends of the Scott Polar Research Institute. What was fun. Ministry of Defence apparently stated in 2017 that the planned out-of-service date for Scott is 2022. However, in February of this year, not 2022, it's indicated that it's been extended to 2023. Mostly because there is an honest understanding that we would need to replace this ship. 
But interestingly enough, she was built by Appledore. And currently, Appledore Shipyard has been bought by Harlan and Wolf. Harlan and Wolf are a very interesting and very capable firm. They have a long history. And one does wonder if perhaps Appledore might be used to build a successor ship to Scott to serve the Royal Navy as well as this vessel has. This vessel's full contribution to the UK will probably never be revealed. I, most of the stuff I know about all the, the, the data she's gathered and the importance of data she's gathered are things which I can't repeat because they are bits given to me as a side, as stories, as things I cannot 100% verify. So I wouldn't put them in a book, I wouldn't put them on here. But I have no qualms saying how important she is. Incredibly important. Echo. Now, Echo and Enterprise are two very important ships for the Royal Navy. She carries a survey motorboat Sapphire. Always a nice little ship to carry. And again, has fulfilled incredibly large number of roles. Again, she uses a um, free watch manning system of 72 crew assigned to her, but while well, she only needs 48 aboard at any one point. A work cycle of these is 75 days on, followed by 30 days off. It helps to keep these ships as available as possible as they possibly can. She has been everywhere and pretty much everywhere in the world. She even took part, went out to Western Australia to go and search for um, Malaysia, the missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. It was in response to a request from British Australian authorities to British Ministry of Defence. Prior to that, she'd been on a 18-month deployment to improve charts used by sea affairs throughout the world. Standard, basically, survey ship program. She deployed to the Black Sea in 2019 for a freedom of navigation maneuver in support of Ukraine. And she's actually visited while she's out there by the UK Defence Secretary in Odessa. Currently... She's reported to be in low readiness slash reserve status, but we can hope that doesn't continue for long, especially when you consider Scott is supposed to be going out of service. And the thing is, you need these ships. One of the reasons why we have these ships is we have to have incredibly detailed scans and charts of the areas around things like Faz Lane, because we need to know if there's anywhere where enemy submarines, or let's say not even enemy, interested parties submarines might lurk to watch our own submarines going in and out, especially the strategic deterrent. So things like Scott, Echo, Enterprise, which are our free survey ships, are absolutely critical. And yes, there is an argument about can we use uncrewed assets for this. The survey boats could well be uncrewed assets. However, the realities of it is that oceanography and hydrography is still a science which is still being developed. And as such, as much as we might think we've conquered it, there is still some, uh, enough of an art involved in it that having people there and closely involved in the loop doesn't hurt. Saying that, I could well see a future ship being a variation on this design having a couple of them, with having three to four survey launches, which are uncrewed vessels launched, all with their own sonars, doing their own thing, and going along with the ship itself, having its own sonar, and having a maximal survey sweep. However, you have a basic problem. Okay, Once you get down to numbers of ships, which are the basics of capability, and as Remember, the basic capability is, one is a white elephant. It's, we have a capability, but 
and when it's available. Two is we usually have a capability available. Three, we always have a capability available. Four, we always have the capability at C and usually have a reserve available. Five, we usually have, we always have two probably available at C, probably a third available, and the other two will be in a, re a refit and various other options. So it builds up quickly in terms of your capability once you have more ships. Six, you are probably looking at guaranteed two, uh, two at C, one of a, a guaranteed one available, probably a second available, and two in re various stages of refit and, uh, refit and unavailability. You can build up numbers. So, with free survey ships, you are at the bare minimum. You really are. Atrus Protector. Now, she is a cute ship, and she, of course, carries uh, survey, motor boat, uh, survey motor boat James Caird IV. Well, that's a cute ship thing to carry. She started off life as the Polybrion or Polar Bear. And, well, the Royal Navy took her into service in 2011. She was laid down in 2000, launched in 2001, completed in 2001, and is, pre is probably one of Britain's most critical assets. She's registered as a research icebreaker and subsea support vessel. And I cannot overstate the amount of work she does. But she's only armed with four mini guns and five general purpose machine guns and a helicopter deck. And again, it's one of those things where it might be useful to have slightly more capacity. In terms of boats and in terms of aircraft. This is the trouble with building uh, with getting off the shelf systems and buying systems which are off the shelf. Yes, you can buy a very capable asset, but you have to spend a lot of money to maybe convert it to what you need. I would argue for Britain the money to have a helicopter capable Arctic will be very, very useful. And when I say helicopter capable, I mean embarking and being able to look after those helicopters because we need slightly more in terms of aviation facilities. Ever so slightly more. Then we have HMS Magpie, one of the newest ships in the Royal Navy service and one of the cutest. This is technically a survey motor launch one of the few independent smaller in a survey ship. She replaced uh, Gleena as the inshore and coastal survey work vessel. And yeah, she's cute. Her first major tasking was surveying Portsmouth Harbour to ensure the stability of the seabed in anticipation of Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, the two aircraft carriers using Portsmouth. Because again, Seabed starts to have trouble if there are problems with the areas which are being dredged for them to get in and out. You're going to have problems with those ships. She also surveyed Mary Rose's um, old wreck site to see if anything more could be found of anything of significance there. And um, then she, after that, she went to look for the French galley, which was lost uh, off the northeast coast of the Isle of Wight uh, at the same time as the Mary Rose. And basically, she did some a lot of little work. Yes, some of it's historically significant, which is good for getting threats for the Royal Navy. But again, some of it is military significant, some of it's st economically, strategically significant, going around the harbours. What you have to remember is that for these ships, going and hunting for a wreck, yeah. That can sound a bit, oh, why is there a Navy ship doing that? Well, because that uses the same skills as hunting anything else. 
requires the same dedication. It requires the same understanding and the same honing of those skills. And it's an actual, tangible, real-world scenario. Remember what I've said in previous videos and this one about false positives of exercises. Going off for a sonar ship, a hydrographic ship, and hunting for something that's of an archaeological nature, well, um, that's a real-world scenario, which can be a real test of its capability. Sometimes it isn't, but sometimes it really is, and it's useful. So survey ships. It's an interesting world we live in. Survey ships matter. Survey ships make the world we live in work. If it doesn't work, we get into trouble very quickly. We do. So you have to think it through. If someone tells you that these ships aren't useful, they probably haven't done the research into them. But also they have the fact that whilst so much of their work is publicised and talked about and is therefore visible and easily consumed, the sheer volume of that data and information that work produced obscures from a lot of sites the work which isn't publicised. And that is where some of the misconceptions and the ideas about privatization, etc., come from. Because, yeah, in theory, if it just does that role, in theory, you can sort of say, well, we could do that. But in practice, because A, that role is more complicated than it looks, and B, they also do all those other roles, you'd rather not. And that is where I'm going to end this sort of video with a question, which I normally put questions in these videos at the end and sort of start cool. The question for this video, and the question I'd like you to think about, is what incident that you've heard about of survey ships that are getting involved in and things that sort of information gathering and involving speaks to you the most? What service have they rendered that speaks to you the most? It'll be interesting to hear what stories people know and if they know stories. Because that's the other thing I worry about with survey ships. I don't think they're very good at singing their own praises. Even though the charts they produce are Very, very useful. Right. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy the videos that come out. There are going to be a lot of long patrols coming out over the next period. I'm going to record, finish recording, hopefully, a chunk of them tomorrow and a chunk of them on Tuesday. So they're all recorded for while I'm away. And interesting. And yes, there are going to be a lot of videos coming out over June. A lot of videos. There are even going to be lies. As said, during the beginning, I am working on making sure the lives on my phone work. And if you've watched all the way to this end, you will know that those lives will possibly include a couple of double lives from me and Drac going out on my system going, Hello everyone, here we are on this ship, we're going to do a quick five minutes chat with you all. So you have to watch, because those are going to be announced, they won't be long, uh, because they'll be on my data. And yeah, they are going to be fun. And before you ask, yes, new case, new phone, it got upgraded last week, and hopefully it all will work. Contract was up, so thanks for an upgrade. So we cross fingers. And it does hook into the uh, other fancy camera, which I have got, which I'm going to be using for recording the ships when I go around them. And actually, theoretically, apparently does do lives. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, I do have plans, though, to pack 
the microphone and the camera in my big case to bring with me. So, take care, have fun, and uh, for those of you in Canada, see you soon. For those of you in the UK, well, now it's starting to get more relaxed COVID-wise. Uh, when I go on my trips to archives, etc., if I am staying in places, I will say, I'm going to be here. If you would like to meet up, please tell me. It'll be nice. Take care, Ron. Have fun, and um, thank you for watching. Thank you again for all your support. Seriously, all the stuff I do, all the trips to Canada, etc., would not be possible without it. So thank you for everything you do.